legal positivism, like most terms, which are used as missiles in intellectual battles, has come to stand for a baffling multitude of different sins. The existence of law is one thing, its merit or demerit is another. A law, which actually exists, is a law, though we happen to dislike it. I must confess that when I first encountered the thoughts of Professor Hart's essay, his argument seemed to me to suffer from a deep inner contradiction. At times he seemed to be saying that the distinction between law and morality is something that exists and will continue to exist, however we may talk about it. At other times, he seemed to be warning us that the reality of the distinction is itself in danger. It is not clear. In other words, whether in Professor Hart's own thinking the distinction between law and morality simply is, or is something that ought to be. Suppose a legal rule forbids you to take a vehicle into the public park. Plainly this forbids an automobile, but what about bicycles, roller skates, toy automobiles? What about airplanes? Are these, as we say, to be called vehicles for the purpose of the rule or not. The most obvious defect of his theory lies in its assumption that problems of interpretation typically turn on the meaning of individual words. If we are to communicate with each other at all, and if, as in the most elementary form of law, we are to express our intentions that a certain type of behavior be regulated by rules, then the general words we use, like vehicle in a case I consider, must have some standard instance in which no doubts are felt about its application. There must be a core of settled meaning, but there will be, as well, a number of debatable cases in which words are neither obviously applicable nor obviously ruled out. What would Professor Hart say if some local patriots wanted to mount on a pedestal a truck used in World War II, while other citizens, regarding the proposed memorial as an eyesore, Support their stand by the no vehicle rule? Does this truck, in perfect working order, fall within the core or the penumbra? We must, in other words, be sufficiently capable of putting ourselves in the position of those who drafted the rule to know what they thought ought to be. It is in the light of this ought that we must decide what the rule is. The reasoning process is not merely a more apt choice of means for the end sought, but a clarification of the end itself. We may call the problems which arise outside the hardcore of standard instances or settled meaning problems of the penumbra. But how does the wrongness of deciding cases in an automatic and mechanical way and the rightness of deciding cases by reference to social purposes show that the utilitarians are wrong in insisting on the distinction between what the law is and what it ought to be. We must, I think, beware of thinking in a too simple-minded fashion about the word ought. The contrast between the mechanical decision and the intelligent one can be reproduced inside a system dedicated to the pursuit of the most evil aims. Professor Hart seems to assume that evil aims may have as much coherence and inner logic as good ones. I, for one, refuse to accept that assumption. I also believe that when men are compelled to explain and justify their decisions, the effect will generally be to pull those decisions toward goodness by whatever standards of ultimate goodness there are. The word what merely reflects the presence of some standard of criticism. One of these standards is a moral standard but not all standards are moral. We say to our neighbor, you ought not to lie, and that may certainly be a moral judgment, but the baffled poisoner may say, I ought to have given her a second dose. The hardcore of settled meaning is law in some centrally important sense. Even if there are borderlines, there must first be lines. By contrast, to soften the distinction, to assert mysteriously that there is some fused identity between law as it is and as it ought to be, 
is to suggest that all legal questions are fundamentally like those of the penumbra. We have to ask ourselves what is actually contributed to the process of interpretation by the common practice of supposing various borderline situations. Professor Hart seems to say, why, nothing at all, unless we are working with problems of the penumbra. But why then, under his theory, if one is dealing with a penumbral problem, is it useful to think about other penumbral problems? By pulling our minds first in one direction, then in another, these cases help us to understand the fabric of thought before us. This fabric is something we seek to discern, so that we may know truly what it is, but it is also something that we inevitably help to create, as we strive to make the statute a coherent, workable whole. We now reach the question whether there is any ground for Gustav Radbruch's belief that positivism in pre-Nazi Germany made smoother the route to dictatorship. Professor Hart regards this as the most outrageous of all charges against positivism. Let us put aside the blunter tools of invective and address ourselves as calmly as we can to the question. Did legal positivism, as practiced and preached in Germany, have any causal connection with Hitler's ascent to power? In 1944 a woman, wishing to be rid of her husband, denounced him to the authorities for insulting remarks he had made about Hitler. In 1949 the wife pleaded that her husband's imprisonment was pursuant to the Nazi statutes and hence that she had committed no crime. The Court of Appeal held that the statute was void. Contrary to the sound, conscience and sense of justice of all decent human beings, the unqualified satisfaction with this result seems to me to be hysteria. Many of us might applaud the objective, that of punishing a woman for an outrageously immoral act, but this was secured only by declaring a statute, established since 1934 not to have the force of law. When we realize that order itself is something that must be worked for, it becomes apparent that the existence of a legal system is always a matter of degree. We cannot simply say, under the Nazis there was law, even if it was bad law. We have instead to inquire how much of a legal system in fact survived. Without any inquiry into the actual workings of whatever remained of a legal system under the Nazis, Professor Hart assumes that something must have persisted that still deserved the name of law. Let us turn to the 1934 statute, upon which Professor Hart relies. Extended. Comment on this legislative monstrosity is scarcely called for, undermined as it is by uncontrolled administrative discretion. We may note only, first, that it offers no justification whatever for the death penalty actually imposed on the husband, though never carried out. Second, that if the wife sacked in informing on her husband made his remarks public, there is no such thing as a private utterance under this statute. Surely the truly liberal answer to any sinister use of the slogan law is law or of the distinction between law and morals is very well, but that does not conclude the question. Law is not morality. Do not let it supplant morality. If with the utilitarians we speak plainly, we say that laws may be law but too evil to be obeyed. If, on the other hand, we formulate our objection as an assertion that these evil things are not law, here is an assertion which many people do not believe and would seem to raise a whole host of philosophical issues before it can be accepted. Surely if we have learned anything from the history of morals it is that the thing to do with a moral dilemma is not to hide it. What is the nature of the dilemma in which we are caught? On the one hand, we have an immoral datum called law, which is the peculiar quality of creating a moral duty to obey it. On the other hand, we have a moral duty to do what we think is right and decent. The dilemma, it states, has the verbal 
formulation of a problem, but the problem it states makes no sense. It is like saying I have to choose between giving food to a starving man and being mimsy. With the bar gives the fundamental postulate of positivism, that law must be strictly severed from morality, seems to deny the possibility of any bridge between the obligation to obey law and other moral obligations. German legal positivism not only banned from legal science any consideration of the moral ends of law, but it was also indifferent to what I have called the inner morality of law itself. The first attacks on the established order were on ramparts which, if they were manned by anyone, were manned by lawyers and judges. These ramparts fell almost without a struggle. Surely it cannot be doubted that, for most cases of purposive interpretation, the language of judicial legislation or even judicial fiat better conveys the realities of the situation. Law, as something deserving loyalty, must represent a human achievement. It cannot be a simple fiat of power or a repetitive pattern discernible in the behavior of state officials. The respect we owe to human laws must surely be different from the respect we accord to the law of gravitation.